And I will take heed to this light that shines in this dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in my heart. In Jesus' name, I will not relent. I will not give up. I will be a Christian. In Jesus' name. Don't let the devil make a fool out of you. Beware lest at any time you be spoiled through philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It don't matter what you think, the Bible says. It doesn't matter what your opinion of certain things is. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. All that matters is verifiable truth. Let's take a look in Matthew chapter 7 once again. We're going to finish up what we started a few weeks ago. And let's start the tape right there, ladies and gents. Those of you that are watching by live stream, welcome. We got the tape started right there. Matthew chapter 7. Father, thank you for the written word. My goodness. How can we fail? We've got a Bible right here. <laughs> the instructions are simple. The test is open book. I'll get a 100. How about that? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus is talking to us. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine, notice these were the same group of people. They were in the same church. They were at the same meeting. They heard the same sayings. And this group in verse 26 heard these sayings of mine and doeth them not. He should be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house. Read the next three words. The King James says, and it fell. And it fell. Say it. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. These folks were in the same meeting. They heard the same sayings, the ones that did them and the ones that didn't do them. And it wasn't two different storms. It was the same rain, the same winds, and the same flood. And it washed some away and washed, and others it could not wash away. They were neighbors. Now we've been talking about, <clears throat> in recent weeks, a study called, let me go back to my notes, a study in church architecture. Did you know Jesus said in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew, He said, I'll build my church. I will build my church. So guess what? The church will be built. Because He said it. And we talked about the word to build in the Scripture, meaning to edify, meaning, which means to improve and to erect and add and make addition to, to confirm and strengthen. And we call a building an edifice, don't we? And we talked one week about how edification, I'm not talking about the building of brick and mortar. We're talking about possibly selling this property and buying another one. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, guess what? We'll do church right here. Either way, Jesus will build His church no matter what we do with our buildings of brick and mortar. Amen. And while we're talking about buildings of brick and mortar, <clears throat> let me remind you of something about all structures, physical structures, Buildings of brick and mortar, I don't care if you build a church, a house, a, a skyscraper, they all ultimately wind up back into the ground, don't they? 
I mean, they're built out of things that are temporal. The framework is mainly built out of wood, and that, that all it's got to do is get wet for a little while, and it rots and goes right back to the ground. The concrete is built out of dirt. It will ultimately, concrete will season after you pour it. It takes, those of you that are construction experts, about three days and it pour it. it's before you can drive on it. And then that concrete gets harder and harder and harder for 30 years. And then after it gets completely, totally cured, it begins to deteriorate and turns back into dirt. <clears throat> We've got that going on out here. All things wind up, all physical things wind up going back to the dust from whence it came. Did you know that Solomon built a temple that if you were to build it today, experts will tell you it probably cost somewhere between five and six hundred billion dollars to build today. And guess what? It's gone. There's no sign of it. But it was there, and the scripture said, the scripture called it exceeding magnifical. It's a word. And then he built a house that almost looked like it. But you know what you find that's left of Solomon's reign? The book of Proverbs. That lasted, will endure throughout eons of time. There will be no, there was no end to that wisdom. Because wisdom... The scripture says, wisdom has builded her house. Wisdom has hewn out her seven pillars. There are buildings that endure to every generation, and they are in the realm of the Spirit. <clears throat> now, there, is a, uh, there are buildings that have been around for quite a while. Uh, some of the oldest uh, buildings in the world are, were built, that it still exists, were built around the year 1000. It's still in the earth. Isn't that amazing? If you ever go to France, look, I actually go online and look it up. There's, a, there's a, a large building in France, I don't know what city, but it's known as Chateau de Rostagnac. And when you look at it, it bears a striking resemblance to the White House in Washington, D.C. It's old. It was in disrepair and animals were in the thing. It has been said that they believe Thomas Jefferson in his uh, uh, travels to France saw it, fell in love with it, got its dimensions and brought the plans back over and the White House was built from his trip to France. He saw Chateau de Rastignac and loved it. And so when you put them side by side, they look extremely, the, the, the likeness is uncanny. I believe that's probably what happened. But they say that building is in a little worse shape than it used to be in. It's been a while. It don't last. Did you notice that uh, those of you that know anything about American history know that, um, that during the time of Lincoln's administration, the Capitol Dome was being erected. And they had thought about because of the expense of the war that maybe they should hold off construction until after the war and Lincoln was determined no he said that rotunda and that capitol dome is the beacon of freedom of our nation and he said the value and the psychology behind keep making sure that it grows is as much the psychological winning of this war than it would be any value in saving the money while the war is still on no let it be built and they built all the way through the Civil War. You notice how that recently, if you ever look on the news, there's a big bunch of scaffolding around that same dome. Why is that? They're totally restoring it. From 1865 to the present, it's been through winds and rains and weather and inclement weather. And it's cold and it's extremely hot. And it's just now, it's beginning to really show its age and they're restoring it to its original glory, and it's going to be better than it's ever been. The beacon of freedom is undergoing a psychological facelift that is telling me something about what's happening with our nation. <laughs> in the real nation, in the realm of the Spirit. Now, I'm talking to you in the same spirit this morning 
about not buildings of brick and mortar. If you're not careful, you'll, you'll, you'll think in terms of only what you can see, taste, touch, and in this natural realm. I'm talking about the, a study in church architecture that has to do with the realm of the spirit where we all really live, a place that always endures. God will give us a building. He'll give you a house. <clears throat> I was over at Terry and Lisa Morgan's house the other night. It's so sweet. It would do you good to meet them. Y'all wave. That's who I'm talking about right there. Get to know them. Oh my goodness. I'm, uh oh, I'm fixing to cost you some money. I was in their house. And I love that place. I saw what sold it to them. And of course, she keeps it spick and span. I love physical places. I love a lot of things. I hadn't seen a car yet I don't like, or a motorcycle I don't prefer. I like manicured golf courses and I like junkyards. I do. <laughs> I like places. God is interested in geographic locations. And if you think He's totally about the spirit and not about the natural, let me remind you. Everybody stomp your foot. He created this place. It's a, it's a natural place. He's not against natural places. He likes big houses. He likes little houses. He likes buildings of brick and mortar. He'll give you a building of brick and mortar. He, wants, he said, you go and dwell in your own sealed houses, but my house lieth waste. He said, you've done a lot. You put a bunch of seed in the ground, but you brought back very little harvest. Why? He said, because... You've gone and dwelt in your own sealed houses, but you've let my house lie waste. He said, now go get wood and mortar and so forth and bring it and build my house that it'll be built. He said, I'll take care of you. Don't neglect the house of God while we're de developing our own houses. Now, <clears throat> everybody still with me on this? All right. Keep our priorities right. Then we talked about how that we build the church by edifying one another and that the opposite of edification is tail-bearing. Have we put away tail bearing? Have we? Yea, barely. Have we? No tail bearing, right? I need to get this big sign put on the wall, that big circle in it with that line diagonal through the middle, and write tail bearing through it. No tail bearing zone because it destroys. It knocks foundations out from under you faster than you can build them. And there's at least five proverbs that talk about it. Then we talked about laying the foundation. And how that James, the book of James, talks about the tongue and the, the words are the seeds of a foundation of a, for a great harvest. And nobody can choose whether or not he lives by words. No one has the right to choose whether or not you live by words. But everybody has a choice of what words they live by. I'm speaking to me here. Romans chapter 10 says, Righteousness speaks. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about how corruption speaks and that God's Word in righteousness spoken, according to the 103rd Psalm, brings angelic visitation. Words spoken, words, edifying words spoken bring angelic visitation. And when it happens, good things happen. <clears throat> and that curses, according to James, bring demonic activity. And I ask us to ask ourselves a question couple of weeks ago. Did the words I just spoke bring angels or demons? Somebody say, oh, oh me, Pastor John. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about building the structure. Now that we've got the foundation laid, once the foundation is laid, you get it laid on a solid foundation, you get it, get it laid on the ground, and we've decided that that foundation is doing the sayings of Jesus. Now let's talk about building the structure up on top. Those of you that are in construction, natural construction, understand construction. After the foundation goes down and the block is there ready to build on top of, what is the first thing that goes on top of that block? Hmm. It's called the seal. 
the seal goes down on top of the block, and then you build on top of the seal that's on top of the block. Now, I'll keep that in your mind, the seal, because I'm going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. <clears throat> Hearing and doing the sayings of Jesus lays a man's foundation upon a solid rock. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 19. Can we put these up, up here above, behind me? Second Timothy 2, 19. All right. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the found... Well, let's back up. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit but to words that are to the subverting of the hearer. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings. They will increase to more ungodliness, and their word will eat, as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hey, Paul just named these people. What would you do if I wrote a letter down to y'all and just told on somebody? Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection's passed already, and then they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, no matter what anybody's saying or doing, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal. Here's the seal on top of the foundation. Here it is. The Lord knows them that are His. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. <clears throat> then he goes ahead and talks about the vessels of the house. Before I get into that, let's, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. He's laid the foundation. He's told us what the seal is. Hebrews chapter 12. He's going to show you something else about building the house of God and building the church and a study in church architecture. Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. <clears throat> Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who in here has faith? The rest of you. Who in here? The rest of you. Do y'all have faith too? Yeah. Okay. Guess what? It's not your faith. It's His. He gave it to you. He authored it. He laid the foundation for it. And now He'll finish it. Every builder will tell you that there has to be an estimate drawn up of every piece of material before they begin even breaking ground. There is a builder's material list that is long and detailed. Now, I want to talk to you today about the finished materials that he will deliver to the job and set it on the job site for us to finish the house. You want to see the, the building materials list? Here it is. Very simple. Very, very simple. It's not hard to do. It's very easy. <clears throat> Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 1. <clears throat> he, get, he starts off by saying, Grace and peace be multiplied to you all. According as, verse 3, as, as God's divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Did the building material that it took to build this church, is, or is this a thing that pertains to life and godliness? Yeah. This building is a thing that per pertains to life and godliness, doesn't it? Well, God gave it. He said He gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these great and precious promises, we might be partakers of His divine nature, having escaped all the corruption that is in the world through lusts. 
And beside this, here is the list of building materials beginning in verse 5, and we'll read on through till uh, verse 11. Beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. We see, there's no sense in putting the, the framework up before the seals down. There's no sense in trying to put on the shingles before you've got the decking built. No, you've got to do this. In, there's a sequence to it. There is a sequence to these things. And first come first. First things have to come first. Here's the first thing. Besides this, give diligence, add to your faith. This is the faith that's already established. Add to your faith virtue. And then to virtue, add knowledge. And then notice virtue had to come before knowledge. Knowledge is afterwards. And then add to knowledge temperance. And to temperance you add patience. And to patience you add godliness. And to godliness brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness charity. Now, this is a, a list of about seven different types of building materials in the Spirit. And here's the result of it. If these things be in you and abound, they make you. Underline those three words. They make you. They're going to make me. See, have you ever heard the saying, he's got it made? What does got it made mean? Means the work's over. He's got it made. These things make you. That you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind. See, if these are not there, if these, if these seven things that he's outlined, and I'll go detail them out in here in just a minute. If these things are not there, then they're blinders. He's blind. He can't see far off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So what remains if you've forgotten that you've been purged from your old sins? You live your life in constant sin consciousness and it will wear you out. God never sent Jesus to the cross and raised Him from the dead so that you could have a sin consciousness for the rest of your life. A sin conscious Christian is a totally defeated Christian. And his house is not built. He's sitting there blind. And he hates himself. I've never seen a self-conscious, sin-conscious Christian that wasn't totally despising of himself. Well, when you're free from sin consciousness, you'll like yourself, and people around you will know it. It's the truth. Then he says this, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Because if you do these things... Read the next four words. You shall never fall. What did Jesus say doing these sayings of mine and hearing these sayings and doing them? What would it do? It don't matter what storm comes. There's, you are not going to fall. There's not a storm strong enough to knock your house down. I don't care if it's the big, bad, wicked wolf. He ain't got enough huff and puff to blow your house down. Hear me? Now listen. We're talking about our kids and our grandkids, aren't we? Remember me telling you the story about some Christians that I've known over the years who appeared to have everything made only for their lives to crash a few years later? And, if, and I'd often said if we'd been given a crystal ball in the early 80s and somebody had come in and told us the terrible things that were going to happen to some of the people that we were in church with, we'd have called them a false prophet and run him out. But all it was is we were all going to church and we were just a bunch. We were, in fact, Janie and I were uh, at the time a, uh, just one couple with one little boy. And we didn't, we, Lord, we, we were waiting. We were believing God for the next gallon of milk, much less. And when people said, you know, we got this Christian school. You want to put your son in this Christian school that we've got. And we wanted to, but we didn't. Are you kidding? $140 a month just to go to Christian school? And she needs a car. <clears throat> And we never put our kids in Christian school. I didn't say anything wrong with it. We just didn't do it. We didn't have the money. We didn't put them in private school. And we showed it in homeschool. Are you kidding? School was the break that Janie needed. <laughs> I mean, after you get past that heartbreak of the first time a child gets on her, you big old yellow bus and swallows him up and goes off 
After a few days, you get used to it. Yeah, let somebody else handle him for a while. Years later, our kids went on through private, uh, public schools and, and secular colleges and all succeeded. And we kept seeing Christian after Christian whose family, children after, child after child, crashed and burned. And it would break my heart. And we didn't understand. They were, they were going to Christian school. They were homeschooling. What was wrong? What happened? We kept noticing the same storms, the financial storms that hit us in 08, as recently as 08, hit earlier too. But they didn't destroy us. Is it because we just happened to dodge the bullet? No. It was just this foundation that was in us. And believe me, I'm still laying these foundation stones in me. I'm still, <clears throat> those of you that know me closer, then others know what I'm talking about. And the rest of them, keep them, don't, don't reveal what you know about Pastor John. Okay? We're all in this together. Wipe your own nose. Sweep off your own welcome mat, praise the Lord. I see sawdust in your eye. I know you do, because you got a four by eight sheet of plywood in yours. No wonder. I'm just funny. Let's look at these things right quick. These finished materials are listed in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. And let's look at them. He said, besides all this, give all diligence. Diligence, first of all, is careful, persistent work and effort. If you're going to build your... Build anything. It's, you have to be careful, persistent. It's going to take work. And effort. I've been to Greg and Tanya's house. They've got a beautiful log cabin over here in Hiram. He built it. it. Took him three years. Torrential rains were trying to stop him. One thing after another. After that, took three, and he built it pretty much by himself. Had some help, but it's amazing looking at it now. It took careful, persistent work and effort. This is the way your spiritual life is. He said, add to your faith. So your faith is something that's already established in you. You don't have to try to get more and more faith. He's already est established it in you. Add to your faith virtue. Anybody want to give me a shot, take a shot at what the meaning of virtue is? Hmm? Scripture, oh, the, the, uh, every translator I have seen calls this high moral and desirable qualities. So add to your faith high moral and desirable qualities. What he's saying is that, um, you know, shoplifting is not going to be real helpful to your faith. You're going to have to quit that. You know, you know, we know what he's talking about. Then after that, he says, add to virtue knowledge. Does this mean you need to be able to quote Shakespeare and what is he talking about knowledge? <clears throat> this is true, justified belief, verified understanding as opposed to mere opinion. I run into a lot of just mere opinion. Well, I'll tell you what I think and I don't want to know what you think. It's like what I think It's worth about Fifteen cents worth of nothing. No. He said, add to your virtue true justified belief. Verified understanding as opposed to opinion. Like, well, I just believe the world just uh, evolved. I just believe we came from monkeys. That's not verified. That's strictly opinion. And you know what? Recently, I've had more respect for the ape kingdom than I have a lot of humans. I'm telling you what's the truth. We were down at Disney, and we went to the animal kingdom, and we saw the silverback gorillas. You ought to have seen that big old guy. He'd stand up on all four, and then he'd stand up on two, and his back was completely white. And he'd stand there. He was the ob obvious alpha male. And there was his wife. She's right there. They mate one time. He's got a couple of little kids. He's standing there watching them. And while they're talking, this ape's bent over. 
And the lady says, did you know that the apes of this animal kingdom have 97% of our DNA? 97% of human DNA. But here's what I find interesting. If two of, two of the kids get in a squabble, all he's got to do is look. And as soon as he looks, they stop. They have respect for dear old dad because they know dad can tear a new one through them. He's standing there watching. And they say that in time, the males begin to get bigger and they'll, they'll keep a black back. They're not silver backed yet. But when they begin to get old enough to, for their back to start turning gray, they will go out of their family and look into another family for a mate. And the alpha male, the big silver back of that family, will notice that there's a male suitor coming along looking for one of his daughters. And he will bless that union. A gorilla! And how he'll bless the union? He'll see that it's about time he's, all he's looking for, he's, the qualification he's looking for is, is his back silver. And he'll grab that male, that alpha male will grab that other one, this young one, grab him by the arm and bring him to his daughter. Isn't that sweet? And he blesses that union. They go on and they'll mate one time and they'll have a new family. And they made up male to female. 97% of our DNA. I think there's 3% of our DNA that's wide open to deception and confusion. Don't you think? I know I'm not politically correct, y'all. I love you. I know Jesus died for all of us. Jesus didn't die for the animal kingdom. He had to die for we that had that 3% DNA that the other animals didn't get. What I'm saying is build your knowledge on top of your virtue that was you gave diligence to to build on top of your faith. The knowledge that's true, justified belief, verified understanding as opposed to just your mere opinion. And I don't care what the Supreme Court rules. It's just opinion. Did you know that the court system is not designed in the United States, nor was it framed by the Constitution? The framers of the Constitution did not frame a judicial system that makes laws. They just write opinion. Add to your knowledge temperance. And then what the next one is? What is temperance? This is known as moderation or just self restraint, especially in eating or drinking. Self restraint. There's some things I just have to withhold myself from. Like I said, I want one of every motorcycle I see. But I have to restrain myself. I am married, therefore I restrain myself. This is temperance. Decide that there's a scripture that says that a man that's going to strive for masteries, I think it's in one of the first or second Timothy, if you're going to strive for the mastery in the ministry, he is temperate in all things. He just keeps a temperance or a restraint or a moderation of self-restraint in all things. Very simple. This is one of the building materials. The next one, add to that. What's the next one? Say it loud, y'all. Patience. patience. This patience is the ability to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering. The ability to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. <laughs> yeah, you can't be Veruca Salt, can you? Daddy, you never get me an Oompa Loompa. Tell you, when you get to a place where you can accept or tolerate delays, problems, suffering, without becoming annoyed or anxious, this is something he said that you can add to yourself. It's just a matter of deciding to add this to your building materials list. After that, add to the to patience. What's the next one? Godness. That's just very simple. Just being like God. What is God like? 
He's a creator. He loves. He's a giver. He's a supplier. Just being godly. You don't have to, this, this basically needs no description. After godliness, what's the next one? Say it loud. Brotherly kindness. This is simply the decision to keep a sweet and helpful demeanor with those you are covenanted to for life. Why is it so easy for us to be real sweet and kind to strangers, but we're ugly to everybody we know that we're real close to and folks we're related to? Why aren't we like that? Why do we tend to be real short-tempered and, and we don't, we, I mean, it's like we, we got you now, so we don't have to, we don't, I don't have to win you over, but we're friendly to everybody we don't know. This is called brotherly kindness, not strangerly kindness. Being just kind to the folks that you... That, are in your, that God thought enough of you to put this person with you in your house and be with them the rest of their life. I ought to be kind to them. What do you think? Fair enough? Simple enough? And then to brotherly kindness, charity. This is the voluntary giving of help, money, or effort to those in need. Now let's go back over it real quick. It's almost time to go home. Be very diligent to add high moral desirable qualities and to that add true justified belief that's verified understanding as opposed to just opinion and add to that a moderation or self-restraint especially in what you're intaking and what you're doing and then add to your temperance, add a patience, add to your self-ability to accept or tolerate delays, problems or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. Add to that just be like God. And then be, keep a decision to keep a sweet and helpful demeanor with those that you're covenanted to for life and be voluntary in your giving of help, money, or effort to those that are in need. Now, here's the, here's the result of it. Here's the result. Pastor, that's, that's hard for me to do all that. Well, guess what? We're not going to do it all today. We're going to add and add and add. And if it took three years to build a house, how much longer do you think it might take to do this? Either way, I'm still adding some of this stuff. Ask Janie. She'll, no, don't ask Janie. She might tell you. I'm still adding this. He said, he says, he, where, he said, wherefore the rather, verse 10, give, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never fall. It's one thing to be called. It's another thing to be elected. Calling and election. And then once you're called and elected, now make it Sure. How do you make it sure? Is it hot in here, y'all? Okay. All right. He said, then he says here, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He did, he's, some people read verse 11 like he said, and when you die and go to heaven, you'll earn your way into heaven because you've done all these things. This is not what he's talking about. He says, this abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is in the earth. We operate in the kingdom right now while we're here. Heaven's a matter of, that's just, that's coming. Now, these seven things assure a life of total success. I'm talking about freedom, liberty, where you don't have to worry about, am I going to stumble and fall today? No, the stumbling's over with. <clears throat> this one right here told me one time something that I had never had anybody tell me. He said, nobody lives like you do. I was listening to him. We were over there in that, um, right there in that, uh, the campus at, at Emory. When he said, nope. He said, you live your life. 85% of everybody I've ever known don't live like you live. He had just had his ears boxed with somebody that basically hammered me to him. Nobody lives that good. Nobody's got a life that good. It can't be true. <clears throat> I said, well, I don't know what he's talking about. I just got up this morning. Ate breakfast. I'm like, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Former uh, pastor. I love him. And he told me, he said, I, you know, he, when he left from here, he said, I still want you to preach my funeral. And I thought, that might happen sooner than you think. You need to hush. <laughs> but he, I guess he just decided maybe... I don't know what his problem was. God love him. I'm not judging him. I just, listen. You know that, you, you, that life's good when you can't find nobody you'd swap with. 
Ain't that wonderful? You know how you are. You, who, who would you swap with? I mean, you got the most beautiful wife. You got a beautiful life. You got a beautiful job. I just could go on and on and on and on and on. When, you, when life is where, where you know God's blessed you to the point, you know there's no possible way you'd ever want to change it. I don't care. Let them criticize. Now, let's look at this list real quick before we go. We've got five minutes. And I want to tell you a story, and then we'll go home. <clears throat> I signed up again to play men's amateur baseball this year. And I run across a man on the team that knows a guy that we played ball with three years ago. And that guy three years ago that I met <clears throat> was playing first base for me. I was pitching, and, and uh, uh, he'd come up, he walked up to me between pitches, called time and come up and said something to me about my mechanics, how I'm kicking and how I'm turning. He said, if you'll, he told me one little thing to do, my first baseman, I'd never met him. And I did exactly what he said, and it changed everything. I became a much better pitcher immediately. So after the game, it was hot, about 100 degrees that day, and we, I pulled out a couple of uh, big things of Gatorade, and it, we're sitting in the shade, and the wind was blowing, and we got to talking, and he said this to me. He said, you know, he said, I just got over stage four cancer. And man, I rejoiced with him. He says, I, he said, I didn't. He says, one time I was laying in the hospital delirious. He said, if you'd asked me, there'd been no way you'd ever, I'd been ever, ever thought that I'd be able to play baseball again, much less. And he said, I have made my mistakes in life. And he began to lament a little bit. He said, all my life, I was capable of. I was a big kid. He said, I was born big, I grew big, I've been big all my life. And he said, I went on through the 60s, he was telling me, he said, I was in high school, and he said, I was a good ball player, could play any game I wanted to play, and he said, I didn't need much training, he seemed to have a natural ability. He said, one day I got a call, and he said, you know, do you, he said, do you ever preach out of First, Second Peter? I said, well, I've been known to. He said, there's a list of, of things in there that, that the Bible says, if you'll just do this, you won't ever fall. He said, and it works for everything. He said, Pastor John, go tell you people to make their calling and their election sure. He said, I had a calling and I had an election, but I didn't make it sure. And he, la he, he made the likeness of the scripture I just read you to his baseball career. He said, I got out of high school. He said, I wasn't going to go to college. He said, I was just going to go get a job. And one day the telephone rang, and it was one of the scouts for the Boston Red Sox. He said, the call just came, just changed our whole life. He said, my mom and dad set up the appointment. He comes, sat at the table, and said, we've scouted him for months. He said, he's a three-tool pitcher. He said, pitch, he, hits, he, he can throw with velocity. He can throw for, for uh, accuracy. And he's got endurance. And he said, uh, we'd like for you to consider letting him come with us, take him into the minor league camp. We, he said, we believe we can teach him how to pitch Boston Red Sox baseball. He said, I was thrilled. He said, and sure enough, went into the minors. He said, I just had a natural ability. He said, and the day came that I flew to Boston. He said, I was down in the bullpen. He said, they called me into the dugout. He said, that never happened with relief, relief pitchers. And he said, the, he named the coach. I have to go look it up on the internet and remember who the coach is. He said, that coach took that baseball in, in his hand and put it in my hand. And he said, he looked me right in the eye. And he asked me, he said, you ready? I said, yes, sir. He said, go get him. He said, Pastor John, he said, I walked out of that dugout stepped across the line, the first base line, and walked up to that pitch, that mound. He said, and I was overcome with emotion. He said, I looked at the big green monster out there in left field, that famous old ballpark. He said, I, I towed the rubber, looked in, and got my sign. He said, and I was looking right in the face of a young rookie by the name of Carlton Fisk. He put one finger down. He said, I kicked and fired. Next thing I knew, 
a 95 mile hour fastball pounded his mitt and I was in the major leagues. He says, you know what the problem was? I didn't add virtue. My off-field antics were terrible. I didn't add to my virtue knowledge. I couldn't be taught anything. My coaches couldn't tell me nothing. I had a 95-mile-hour fastball. There wasn't no coach who could look at me and tell me that he had a 95-mile-hour fastball and could tell me anything. To knowledge, temperance. I was intemperate in everything. I ate everything I wanted, drank everything I wanted, did everything I wanted to do, went to every bar, every, went to every bar you could think of, just, just lost my mind. I was intemperate in all things. What's the next one? He said, I was totally impatient. He said, if I couldn't be slated to pitch, I threw a fit. I was impatient. What's the next one? He said, there wasn't no such thing as godliness in 1971. Not with me. The next one. He said, I didn't, nobody liked me on the team. What's the next one? Yeah. He said, signed a big contract, made some big money. He said, it was all for me. Didn't give a dime up to nobody. He said, sometimes these, these uh, folks, advocates of the team would come around and want to know if we'd give a, like just a small token to some of the retired ball players that didn't have retirement. I have nothing for nobody. He said, my career skewed off within 36 months. I was back at home working a regular job. He said, I had it all. He said, this list works for everything. It's not just Bible people. He said, the first time I read that, after I got saved, I got to thinking, if I had just done this, he said, I'd have had a long career. He said, Carlton did. He said, he tore his knee out bad. He got hit at the plate that same year. Tore his knee out real bad. He said, his knee would look like spaghetti. He said, he rehabbed that thing and came back and had a long career with the Boston Red Sox. Then was uh, released and went on and, and caught for the Chicago White Sox. He said, I could have been right there with you. He said, but I didn't have no sense. The flood came, the winds blew, the rains descended, and it beat on his house and it had a great fall. I wonder how many hundreds of thousands of dollars it cost him just to not have this list. Thank you for joining us today for the WordWise Christian broadcast. Remember, God gave us his written word to get our thinking straightened out. It's when his mindset becomes our own that peace settles in, our confession and our, and our belief system gets straightened out because we have become word-wise. God bless you. See you next week.